Hi, my name is Gregory Fursin, and I'm very happy to present you this TVM Con tutorial about how we can automate and simplify MLPF inference benchmark using Apache TVM and the Collective Knowledge Framework. All the material is available online, and you can find it using this shortcut here, or if you click on it, you will go to GitHub. And I would like to thank uh, my great colleagues for helping me to prepare this tutorial and building the technology. Uh, Thomas Zhu from Oxford University, Alexander Peskov from Delvin, and Thierry Moreau from OctML. I will start with the motivation for this project, and I will introduce MLPerf for those who are not familiar with this benchmark. And then I'll briefly introduce uh, Apache TVM and the Collective Knowledge Framework. And then we will move on with this tutorial. Uh, in the past few years, we have seen uh, the Cambrian explosion of hardware devices that can run machine learning inference uh, from powerful GPUs and CPUs in the cloud to really very low power uh, devices and embedded systems at the edge. Uh, nowadays, uh, there are probably more than a hundred of companies that are building uh, machine learning inference hardware, uh, and that can easily spawn uh, several orders of magnitude in performance and power. Uh, at the same time, there are many competing uh, machine learning software frameworks, libraries, and uh, picking at the most efficient software hardware stack uh, for each individual use case is extremely difficult. And worse, uh, whenever companies are reporting their numbers, uh, it's very difficult to provide an apple to apple comparison because everyone is using their own tools and methodology. Uh, that's why several years ago, a few dozen companies and universities decided to join forces uh, to create a common and open machine learning benchmark uh, that could provide fair, reproducible and consistent measurements of accuracy, latency, throughput, power consumption, and other metrics uh, across all this variety of uh, machine learning hardware, software models, and data sets. And later, uh, a non-profit organization was created called ML Commons. Uh, basically, this organization supports the development of uh, this benchmark, uh, submission of results, usually twice a year. Uh, and uh, there are also several very interesting and uh, useful community projects on data sets, best practices, and so on. So for those who are not yet familiar with this uh, organization and their projects, please have a look at this website, and I would strongly recommend to join this very important community effort. And this tutorial will focus on the MLPERF inference benchmark. And again, for those who are not familiar with this benchmark, please have a look at this archived paper from last year. Uh, that introduces all the concepts and, more importantly, the benchmarking methodology and different uh, modes uh, of this benchmark. And at the same time, you can find uh, the open source code for this benchmark at GitHub here. And uh, it's a very actively developed benchmark. And you can also see all the reference applications that are used uh, for submission. Uh, the perfect for submissions happen twice a year. And you have to be an ML Commons member to submit results. Uh, and after being validated, they're published at the ML Commons website. So you can basically follow the news. And here you can see uh, the latest inference version 1.1 results that were published just a few months ago. And those results are split into two groups for data center and for edge. And at the same time, you can see uh, two divisions, closed and open. And the closed division is uh, you have to follow very strict rules on your models, uh, data sets, optimization techniques, and overall methodology. Uh, so basically, it allows you apple to apple comparison of different software hardware stacks. And open division is much more flexible and it's more like a test bed where you can uh, play with different models and optimization techniques. As a founding member of my Commons, uh, I participated in all my perfect inference submissions, and I can clearly see a growing interest from the community where the MLPERF benchmark becomes really important. And so far, we had around 20 organizations uh, who have submitted results to the MLPERF inference benchmark over the past two years. And still, uh, with uh, hundreds of organizations uh, very active in the MLPERF inference software and hardware business, one may wonder. Why we actually don't see more companies uh, submitting their results so that they can showcase how well machine learning models can run on their hardware or being optimized using their software. And we realize that the barrier of entry to MLPERF is still quite high. So the first challenge for any new participant uh, is that getting an MLPERF machine learning model running efficiently on their new hardware 
uh, requires manually building a quite complex software pipeline and then connecting together many layers of the machine learning stack. And each layer has many options and configuration parameters. And from my experience, it can easily take a few months of effort from a dedicated machine learning systems engineering team. And the second challenge uh, is that afterwards you have to perform full stack optimization and fine tuning uh, just to get the world-class uh, performance. And this is an increasingly difficult task that requires many resources and can be afforded mostly by large organizations at the moment. At OctoML, we are particularly interested in all those challenges because we are building a platform that can help you automatically optimize and deploy any machine learning model uh, on any hardware. And that's why we decided to join ML Commons and participate in the latest round of ML Perf inference submissions because we wanted to test if our technology can help to really simplify and automate this complex submission process uh, using our Apache TVM and the Collective Knowledge Automation Framework. And our goal is really to lower the barrier of entry for new participants in the future. So Apache TVM was created by the founders of OctoML uh, as an end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning compiler framework uh, that can automatically optimize and run uh, machine learning models on any hardware backend. And obviously at this TVM con, you will see many exciting extensions uh, to this compiler framework. And you will also see many exciting projects which are built on top of Apache TVM. Uh, as for the collective knowledge framework, uh, I designed it some years ago when I was trying to solve multiple issues with reproducibility and apple to apple comparison of experimental results from research papers, and particularly at machine learning and systems conferences. And that's when I started uh, collaborating with ACM and many great colleagues, uh, trying to come up with a common methodology for reproducible benchmarking. And this is very similar to what the Commons is trying to do nowadays for machine learning. And that's when I also realized that we're really missing um, a very simple, uh, portable and technology neutral framework uh, that can run experiments uh, in a reproducible way and particularly uh, across continuously changing software and hardware. And if you're interested to know more about CK and the concepts, uh, I suggest you to have a look at this uh, ACM tech talk from this year, where I explained all the history behind CK. And you can look uh, at this archive paper uh, where I introduce all the concepts. My idea behind collective knowledge framework was to let uh, the community implement different automation recipes uh, needed for reproducible and portable benchmarking and share them in such a way that they can be reused across different research projects uh, by different people uh, while keeping backwards compatibility. And that's why all such automation recipes uh, have uh, unified API, unified command line interfaces, unified uh, web services, and unified and accessible meta descriptions. Uh, over the past years, we collaborated with the community to implement different uh, automation recipes uh, needed for uh, reproducible and portable benchmarking of machine learning systems, including detection of platform information in a unified way, uh, monitoring system state, uh, detecting software dependencies needed for a project or installing missing packages uh, across different operating systems in a unified way. And that don't have to be software, but it can be models, data sets, or actually any other artifact uh, needed for reproducibility. And then you could use those automation recipes as basic blocks or kind of Lego bricks uh, to implement more complex and portable workflows that can unify benchmark execution, particularly across continuously changing software and hardware so that we can actually adapt our workflows to any new environment. And then we can implement uh, automation recipes uh, to unify statistical analysis of results and make sure that we have a level comparison. Uh, and we can record all the provenance uh, in such a way that we can reproduce results later or even run them on a different system. And at the end, uh, you can also have a common format for uh, research projects. So whenever I see a project, CK compatible project on GitHub or shared inside a container, I know that I can always use the same commands, the same API to run those experiments and get results in a unified way. Interestingly, we have validated the collective knowledge approach a few years ago when we organized the first reproducible tournament uh, took a design 
prioritization machine learning systems together with a few of the main founders and with ECM at Daskos conference. And what we did there is we collected all the experiments from the community across different software and hardware stacks. We unified them using the CK framework and then we visualize them using the CK dashboard so that you can perform apple to apple comparison. And at the same time, you can reproduce any experiment because you now have all the provenance, all the dependencies, and you can use uh, simple CK comments to replay such experiments and even detect discrepancies. And that's why we started thinking that we can use exactly the same infrastructure to automate the matter and make it more customizable, portable, reproducible, and easy to use. And at the same time, if we have TDM as a backend to ML perf, we can make it much easier for new submitters to submit results uh, for new hardware, because then you can actually take advantage of all the powerful tuning techniques inside TDM uh, to get much better performance for new hardware. And that's what we did for the latest ML perf inference submission round. So we have developed a TDM backend uh, for the MLPF inference benchmark, uh, starting from the digital application. Uh, and by the way, uh, we plan to add it to the main line in a few months. Uh, at the same time, we have developed a new CK repository where we have shared different automation recipes to describe MLPF uh, hardware systems in a unified way, uh, run MLPF uh, inference in a unified way, and automate submissions using MLPF uh, methodology. And by the way, notice that since of the main is an open source company, all those developments are also open source and available under Apache license, and we continue these developments as a community effort. Uh, at the same time, we have developed different packages to either detect or install or even rebuild TDM, LTM, DNN, Onyx, and other tools. Uh, we could uh, use uh, CK to automatically install different MLPF models or data sets. And we have developed different uh, CK workflows uh, to run a MLPF inference benchmark uh, and the different applications like image classification, object detection, language, and so on. We use this infrastructure to automate our submissions and uh, we succeeded. So you can see several entries from OptiMail uh, using Amazon and Google Cloud uh, and one of our latest versions of TDM. And all those results are available on open information to reproduce our results. Uh, can be found at the Semi Commons repository inference results version 1.1 uh, under our name, including this reproducibility report. Now I'd like to go through this reproducibility report uh, to show you basic and quite simple CK commons uh, that can help you prepare your own platform to run uh, MLPF inference benchmark and particular image classification. And later, Tomah will present you his own experience to use and extend CK framework. For this example, we will use AWS uh, Cloud Instance with Intel Xeon processor and Ubuntu. However, CK itself is a very small and portable framework with minimum dependencies, and we ran it on very diverse hardware platforms and operating systems, including Windows, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, uh, Amazon Linux. Um, and you can run it on embedded devices and uh, on mobile phones. First, you need to install some system dependencies for Ubuntu, uh, pretty standard ones, uh, unless you are using one of our adaptive and of containers where everything is pre-installed. And then you need to make sure that you have a Python version 3.7 or more. Uh, actually, a CK framework can work with any Python, including all versions, but the MLPERF requires uh, this specific version. And then uh, installing a CK framework is pretty easy and you can use pip install. Uh, here I already have it installed. And as you can see, it just requires uh, YAML dependency and that's all. Now you can start uh, running CK commands and CK command line interface is relatively straightforward. So basically you need to invoke CK with some action from some automation recipe, uh, which is called CK module. And then you may apply it to some object, CK object. So then you would add uh, a cone and CK object. And then you would use some flags. And internally, uh, all actions have an associated Python function in the CK module. 
and all the flags from a common line are converted into dictionary uh, before calling this function. And the output is also a dictionary. That's why uh, we also have a very similar and simple uh, Python interface uh, to the same actions. And we have uh, bindings to other languages. And this means that we can also uh, use uh, CK automation recipes as web services and connect them with other frameworks and use them quite easily in continuous integration systems. The CK framework that we have just installed already includes many stable automation recipes from the community, such as cross meta package manager. Uh, to list all those automation recipes, you can just use the following common CK list module. And you will see all the pre-installed um, automation recipes. And you can find the uh, automation recipe related to this package manager using, let's say, wildcards. So here we see package. And you can uh, list all the actions available inside this automation recipe using CK help. Let's say CK help package. You will see that we can install a package or add a new one and other actions. And we can also see the flags available for a given uh, automation action. Let's say CK install package just by using minus minus help. So you will see an API with an input dictionary and output dictionary that you usually use uh, from Python interface. But at the same time, you can use exactly the same uh, keys uh, as flags from the command line. Now let's check if we have some uh, CK packages already pre-installed in the system. So we'll just call CK list package uh, column star or what is equivalent to CK list package. And we see that we don't have any. And the reason is that CK framework comes with some stable automation recipes, but all the related objects like packages are shared by the community uh, using their own public or private GitHub repositories, or GitLab or zip files. And you need to use CK automation recipe to pull uh, such repositories to be able to use uh, such objects. You can see this common CK pool repo here. For example, we can see this uh, collective knowledge MLOps uh, repository from ML Commons, where we have collected many automation recipes and objects to enable portable MLOps. And if we want to reuse it, we just need to pull it using CK common CK pool repo. At pool. So CK will pull this GitHub repository, will install uh, required Python dependencies if needed, and will also actually check uh, dependencies on other CK repositories because you may want to reuse automation recipes and objects from other uh, repositories shared by the community. Mm -hmm. Then you can find where it is located using the common CK where repo. So you see where it's installed on your system. And now what is interesting is that if we now list packages, we'll see now very many uh, CK packages available uh, in the system. And notice that uh, CK packages are not just related to software, but they can be data sets or uh, models uh, or any other artifact that is needed to run your workflows. And now we can start preparing uh, your environment to run a malperformance benchmark using other CK automation recipes. For example, we can set up some uh, global parameters in the CK using CK setup kernel command. Then we can detect uh, some information about your platform in a unified way using CK detect uh, platform .os, uh, command and internally CK will set up some scripts uh, that uh, will monitor the system state and frequencies of your system to ensure reproducibility. We can then detect uh, some software installed on your system and needed uh, for MLPerf. And again, notice that this can be done automatically when you invoke your workflow, but I'm just showing some explicit comments uh, so that you grasp an idea behind CK. So for example, we can detect Python and notice that this automation recipe will be searching for all uh, installations uh, of a Python and it will give you a choice uh, so that you can select one or actually more versions if needed. We can detect GCC in a similar way and there is only one version installed and we can detect CMake, uh, which is also needed by MLPAR. We have also provided an abstraction for virtual environments in the CK framework so that whenever you detect some software or install a package, uh, we'll create an associated end, uh, entry in the CK framework uh, where we will keep information about uh, different environment variables for a given version of a given software 
including paths to binaries and the libraries. And this allows us to decouple uh, workflows uh, from tools so that we can actually easily swap uh, different versions of different software or data sets or models. And here, for example, you can see already detected or installed software using CK show and common. And you will see uh, that we uh, detected uh, Python, CMake, and GC. Now let's install all other CK packages needed uh, for this MLPerf inference version 1.1. Uh, for example, we want to use our own uh, branch of MLPerf inference with the VM backend available at this repository. And we created an associated package uh, called MLPerf inference source um, that is described using this meta.json uh, file. It basically, it has some uh, variables, environment variables for the installation, and it has tags to find this package and it has different variations for this uh, package. So now to install uh, a specific version, uh, we use this command and we specify all the tags in the command line. Uh, so CK finds a package based on those tags. And as you can see, it's uh, started downloading uh, this GitHub repository with all the submodules. And then it's installed in the CK. So we can see it now using CK show and we can see my perfect friend source of the main branch. Next, we can install different Python packages using CK. And technically speaking, we could use CK to detect already installed uh, Python packages. But uh, here, I prefer to use explicit installation command uh, so that we know exactly how we install those packages. And we can also control versions. I don't use versions here, but you can use uh, and fix a specific version using tags. So let's just quickly do this. And I will uh, copy and paste uh, CK command in one row. Uh, again, we use our own virtual environment so that we can uh, actually have multiple versions of the same tool uh, installed at the same time. And when we use like the workflows, actually CK can detect that you have several versions and it can suggest you to use uh, a specific one. And then we can also install uh, MLPerf or Gen. And this is also a CK package. And again, uh, uh, load gen is changing, so we can fix a specific version if we want to. And here, uh, CK will also detect that there is a dependency on CMake and on the compiler, and it will substitute and use uh, both CMake and compiler, which was detected in previous steps. So again, if you have multiple versions of compilers and CMake, you can actually choose the ones which you want to use. And then we will install uh, tool which is actually not needed for image classification but it's still needed uh, as a some as a dependency for mlperf and now again when we show ckn uh, we now see all those python packages installed mlperf load gen and uh, all the other tools needed to run mlperf finally we can start installing machine learning frameworks uh, runtime systems libraries and compilers that we want to use with our MLPerf inference benchmark. And again, we can either detect already installed software or we, install, we can install specific versions using CK. And again, we can also have multiple versions installed and CK workflows will tell you, will suggest you to select the ones which you want to use. So for example, first we can install uh, Onyx. And we usually need Onyx to uh, import models. Then uh, the same, there are some dependencies in MLPerf on uh, PyTorch and Torch Vision, if I remember correctly, for the dataset conversion. And here versions have to be compatible, so we fix them. Uh, but later we actually plan to do a more complex, a sophisticated uh, dependency resolver to find the compatible versions automatically. Uh, at the same time, now we'll start uh, preparing a TDM compiler and we'll rebuild it, even though we can use like a pre-built version, but here we want to use uh, TDM with DNNL library. So it requires a specific version of CMake, so that's why we're not using CMake from the system, but we're actually installing it using CK, to, again, to make sure that the version is correct. 
and we uh, install uh, LLVM compiler, uh, a pre-built version 12.0, again using CK. Then we will install uh, DNNL. And notice uh, if uh, most of the previous packages were already pre-built and pre-installed, uh, here we will rebuild uh, DNNL framework. And here we are forcing uh, to use LLVM compiler. And again, CK will detect that we installed LLVM version 12.0 and it will use it for this package. So let's build the DNNL. It will take some time. And later, uh, the last step will be to install KVM compiler. And again, we will build it and we will turn on different environment variables. For example, here we say that we want to use the NNL library. And at the same time, we'll use uh, OpenMP, GNU version. We will set up how many processes we want to use. And then the, the quiet flag for CK tells you that we don't want to ask any questions and we just will rebuild uh, this package by uh, substituting all the versions uh, from CK. And now we're ready to build the TVM. Uh, and we again, we will use all the dependencies which were installed using CK, including DNNL and uh, LLVM compiler. And notice that uh, you can customize your installation uh, using those minus minus N uh, flags. So here we, we set use DNNL code gen to on. And the same we use OpenMP GNU version. And the quiet flag uh, tells CK uh, to select uh, the default version of a given tool, of a given dependency. And this is needed again if you have multiple dependent multiple versions of the same dependency detected on your system. So let's try to do that. So uh, CK substitute all the paths with uh, uh, the tools installed uh, as CK packages. And of course, if uh, some dependencies are not installed uh, using CK, that's fine. Uh, the CMake will then uh, use uh, default versions available within the system or fail. Uh, but that's where you can control uh, which dependencies you want to be a system dependency or which one you want to be installed. And usually it's uh, you are installing dependencies using CK when you want to make sure that there is a specific version used. And this is particularly important for to ensure reproducibility. Now we can install the final CK packages for data sets and models that are needed for a specific uh, MLPerf inference application, such as image classification in our case. And for image classification, MLPerf uses uh, ImageNet. And we separated ImageNet into two CK packages, uh, the main one with ImageNet validation set, which has 50,000 images. However, uh, it's not anymore available for direct download. And that's why you can use CK to detect uh, already installed ImageNet on your system and then it will be automatically plugged in into CK workflow. Or we created another package with a reduced uh, ImageNet with only just 500 images uh, to help you test uh, your MLPF workflow. And you can install it using this command where we specify tags, uh, ImageNet, validation, minimum, and non resize, so that's original size. So let's install it. And then the second part of this package is ImageNet Auxiliary. So again, let's install it. And now you can also install the MLPerf uh, model. And for image classification, you, we use ResNet 50. And in fact, you can use two models, uh, quantized and non-quantized. So here I will try to install two models. Uh, if I'm not specifying versions, CK should find all the packages uh, compatible with those tags. And here it finds two uh, quantized and non-quantized models. So let's install both. And you can see that all those models, we keep them on Zenodo, which is a permanent archive. It's useful uh, to keep and preserve artifacts uh, that is really important for reproducibility. Now we can start running CK workflows. And in our case, it's MLPerf inference image classification with TVM and targeting CPU. And usually such workflows have multiple command lines. So we can specify them using a TMD key flag. And since uh, such workflows may have some extra Python dependencies, 
or other dependencies, we can, we can first try to install them using this command. So all the dependencies are resolved, so no problem. And then we can actually start running malperf inference benchmark. So for example, let's start from uh, checking accuracy in offline mode, offline scenario. And basically you need to run this command which specifies how many times we want to run this workflow. Um, the command line will be accuracy offline. And then we specify various environment variables to tell MLPerf that we want to use PBM backend um, and some extra parameters. Let's try that. So now, as you can see, CK detected that we have several models available. Uh, quantize and quantize and ask you to choose which one to use. So let's choose the first one. Quantize model. And basically what CK does, CK uh, resolves all the dependencies and uh, prepares all the paths to install packages or detected ones. And then it prepares a common line uh, to run a malperf load gen and it suits all the environment variables. Then it runs it. it actually does also create a post-processing and unify results. So now we can see the accuracy. And now let's uh, check uh, performance uh, of this benchmark in offline scenario. And again, it will be more or less the same CK command with a few minor changes, like we will change CK yeah, command line key. It's now performance offline. And we'll specify some extra options for MLPR flow gen. Except that instead of using the full run 10 minutes, I will just do 10 seconds just to test it. And again, CK asks us about uh, which model to use. And by the way, notice just that it's easy to remove one of those models. So we know that environment unique ID in the CK database is this one. So I can copy it. Let me stop this workflow and I can just remove an environment uh, with this unique ID. And now when I run again the same workflow, CK will not be asking me any, anything because we'll be using only one model available. So that's what it did. It resolved the model uh, and it uses quantized model now. So now TVM is compiling this model, uh, which takes a little bit of time. And then uh, CK started the uh, MLP flow gen with the TVM backend and with, uh, with a specific model and specific data set. And uh, what is interesting is that if you don't use CK, uh, preparing all those steps, preparing all the environment, uh, downloading correct versions of tools, data sets, models, uh, doing pre-processing and post-processing and uh, figuring out which command line you need and then running those benchmarks, it's really a very tedious task. And here, as you can see, just going through all those basic steps, we uh, automate this process and make it much more reproducible. And then here you see the official MLPerf results summary. So everything is working and correct. If you want to submit such results to MLPerf, you need to create a quite sophisticated directory structure for a submission. For example, what you can see for OctML, uh, and it has very specific format and it is uh, automatically validated for correctness. Uh, that's why we created another repository, CK repository with more automation recipes that fully automate the process of submission and creation of those directory structures. Uh, for the sake of time, I will not run those comments, but please uh, check uh, this tutorial further and you will see basically similar comments. Uh, CK pool repository, CK install package with uh, dumb inference results, which will be populated with your new results. Then we uh, set up uh default parameters in, in ck uh, to specify the submitter and then we are adding your system to the ck and then we do more or less the same steps as above except uh, we are using yet another wrapper on top of the ck workflows called benchmark perf inference uh, that will run our workflow and at the end of the run uh, it will validate your submission and it will prepare automatically all those directories and populate them with the results and validate them. So it really simplified the task. And uh, from our experience, uh, we reduced the time of submission from sometimes weeks to, to days and hours. And next, uh, Tomah will tell you about his experience uh, using CK and extending it to support uh, other MLPerf uh, applications, 
uh, frameworks, data sets, and models. Hello, everyone. My name is Hawan Zhu, or you can call me Thomas. I'm a student at Oxford University, Oxford University studying math and computer science, and um, I've been working at OctoML since July this year. And my work at OctoML is basically to use the CK framework to add benchmark workflows for the ML perf inference uh, benchmarks. And so basically in this context, CK, the CK framework manages easy to use and re reproducible and cross platform workflows. And so basically every single benchmark in the ML perf inference, so like uh, image classification or object detection or language processing, that's a single program in the um, in the CK framework, and programs are designed to work cross-platform, and they can be easily extended and tweaked to to um, to use different frameworks like Onyx versus PyTorch versus TensorFlow, or or even to use the PVM backend, and also um, you can extend them from different hardware from one, one hardware to another, and um, also the dataset and model. Uh, prerequisites can be specified in the CK the CK framework, so they can be automatically pulled for when a user tries to run the uh, benchmark. Uh, for example, language processing. So in language processing, when a user tries to run the program, um, it will automatically pull the different prerequisites. So basically, like Onyx, an Onyx model and a framework and the squad uh, version one point one dataset. If the user doesn't already have them. And it should be situated in uh, the it should, it should be in the program MLperf language CPU and so basically in a meta file we'll specify this that this workflow needs the squad version one point one data set and a model um here a Burke large model and also a Nonix runtime um, framework and. So we have already worked on um, a range of different workflows, and here's a tabulation of the different workflows we have already added. So on the left is the different tasks of mperf inference, and um, and uh, we actually use the TVM um, implementation or the TVM framework for the image classification as a submission to mperf inference version one point one, and uh, in the open division. Uh, this year and uh, the other workflows we have already added are are really easy to extend to and from one another so so during my time at octml i've already added the um, medical imaging and language processing workflows and i'm working on the recomm deep learning recommendation model workflow and the way i add these is basically just to copy a branch of let's say um image classification workflow the task and i use that program and tweak the parameters within it. So basically I can swap out the dependency on, for example, ResNet to a dependency on a Burke large model. And uh, I can, I'll change the parameters. So basically the parameters that are fed to the program, like um, the the work, the, the task, I'll change it to, from image classification to language processing and uh, maybe change some scripts and some the model location and the data set from ImageNet to squad um, version 1.1 and basically I'm set I have a new frame uh, a new workflow um, in language processing instead of Im image classification that's easily created uh, from the CK. So just to give an example of how a workflow is structured in the CK framework I'm going to give an example of the language processing workflow in mlperf in the CK ML ops repository. So here um, I'm at a, a directory of the clone of a CK ML ops uh, direct, um, repository, and I'm going to head to the language processing program. So it's a inference benchmark language processing, and then on X CPU. And here um, there are three files here. So um, the one that matters is in CM dot CM meta JSON. So here the meta.json basically lists um, the specifications of this workflow. So basically how it should be run. Um, so one of the dependencies that it needs is the uh, Onyx runtime package for Python. So the way to do that is to add this um, dependency here in the run dependencies. And um, there are also some uh, local 
um, environment variables that I, I can specify here. So basically, this workflow is for CPU. So I think that's the reason here why here the Gutenberg device is set to an empty string and um, the device is set to CPU for the program to register in CPU. And also, there are a lot of tags added here. So tags in the CK framework basically mean um, what uh, are basically ways or queries keywords to to look up for a workflow. And so if I want to run this work, uh, workflow, I can specify that using tags or the name of this workflow. And also there's this base entry in program.template. And this base entry is basically like a parent um, description of this workflow. And um, it actually refers to program.template. Oh, sorry. Program.template ML proof in French language. So this is the base entry. Um, it, it doesn't specify if it's Onyx or not. And if I read its method JSON file, it has more um, description of what dependencies the workflow needs. So basically like the squad 1.1 um, data set that, will, that the CK will pull or download from, from the website and, um, and some other dependency that it might need. So like PyTorch, and the model of, of the language processing. So here the here actually I didn't specify if it's BERT or not. So that's the reason why you can actually swap out the BERT model for a different question question answering model in this workflow. And the way to run this workflow would be to just go CK run program and um, let me put the name of this workflow in there. And basically it starts to run. And then if I specify, I want to run it in the performance um, single stream format. And then it's here, I think installing the squad version 1.1. And um, also there are two different models that I can download the quantize and not quantize version. So if I download the, the default um, not quantized version, the floating point version, then it'll start to download. And um, I'm not going to show the whole uh, program because it's too long. And basically that's the gist of it. And let me interrupt this thing. Just to give a final example of how to add workflows in the CK framework, I'm going to uh, try to add a PyTorch, mod, a PyTorch workflow based on the Onyx workflow for language processing and uh, MLPerf. So here I'll just use the CK copy command and specify MLPerf inference. Benchmark. Um, it's language in Onyx CPU, and then I'm gonna name the new one to improve inference benchmark language PyTorch CPU. And um, if I head to the and to finalize the change, I, I simply have to head to the uh, meta file. So here, uh, if I edit the meta file, and the the copied one can be edited like this to just make it, for example, here I can just specify to add a PyTorch um, dependency instead of an Onyx one. And um, I can also change the backend here to PyTorch. Uh, so basically this backend is just a parameter for the MLPerf, um, for the MLPerf code. And, and also maybe I'll change the model dependency from an Onyx format to a PyTorch format. But other than those, I I basically have a new workflow that's uh, PyTorch instead of Onyx. So, so I would say that adding workflows in the CK framework or just this interoperability in general is really useful for the, um, for adding and changing workflows in the CK framework. Thank you for your participation. And know that this is still a quite preliminary work, so we're very interested in your feedback. And uh, we continue this uh, work with NML Commons, and particularly we plan to create a new working group uh, on CK-based design space exploration. Uh, we plan to add TVM support to all ML perf inference and training benchmarks in 2022. We're now developing the new version of CK uh, together with my Commons colleagues. And we continuously add more uh, machine learning models, data sets, frameworks, compilers, and libraries as plug and play CK packages. And we continue collaborating with many other machine learning projects. So if you're interested in this community effort, please uh, join us uh, and uh, just get in touch with either with me or my great colleagues. Uh, thank you very much.
Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that presentation, Gregory. Um, I, I think you showed a lot of really cool ways that we can use CK to automate uh, benchmarking. Uh, and you pointed out a lot of reasons why benchmarking is uh, difficult using uh, traditional tools. So if anyone in the chat uh, or watching has questions uh, for Gregory, please ask them now. Uh, I'll keep an eye on the Q&A and make sure those all get answered. Um, while, while you type that up, I, I do have a couple questions just about your take on uh, MLPerf and CK. Um, so I, I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on what the right use cases for MLPerf are in machine learning. Um, you know, I, I think it had a lot of uh, aspirations when it was designed. Um, and I'm curious just on your view of like, how, how should a casual machine learning user like myself <laughs> uh, view MLPerf results? Or are there, are there certain like lenses that it's most valuable through? Mm. That's a good question. Uh, so I think, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this tutorial, that uh, you know uh, we can see lots of different performance numbers uh, being published every day, and actually uh, we don't always trust them. So that was one of the biggest challenges. I think that you have all those not only like numbers from research papers, but numbers from companies and so on. So. I think nowadays when I look at MLPerf numbers, I, I can actually trust them. I know that it goes through a very rigorous validation process. And that's why, <laughs> that's why sometimes it's difficult to submit results. But at the end, if you have those results, you can actually trust them. And I think this is the biggest, the, the most important uh, part of MLPerf is that these are results which are trustable and you can have uh, apple to apple comparison of different uh, machine learning stacks. So for me, this is probably the the most important aspect of MLPR. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in knowing um, if there, you, you mentioned there are other tools you're collaborating with extending CK2. Uh, what, what do you imagine the CK ecosystem looking like a, a year or two from now, beyond TVM perhaps? Uh, so. I also mentioned that my original reason why I designed CK was actually to improve the reproducibility of our research, of machine learning research. So it's not necessarily related to just TVM or other frameworks. So, and uh, I do hope to continue collaborating with, with some organizations like ACM and IEEE to uh, help researchers share the results in a kind of more reproducible way. And uh, CK, I hope CK or whatever CK tool, whatever framework will be there, can help with that. And uh, in machine learning research, we have lots of issues re with reproducibility. So I do hope that uh, this kind of concept of portable workflows can really help uh, make uh, machine learning research more reproducible and portable. So that's, that's my hope that in, in a year or two, uh, we will start using portable workflows to share results, not just containers. Containers are very good and important, but usually you fix all the dependencies inside containers. Nowadays, I would like to have a, a workflow where I can run my machine learning model and can adapt to your environment. So you have a slightly different version of a TVM, slightly different version of, I don't know, PyTorch or an Onyx. And I can, my workflow can detect that, understand how to run my model in the most efficient way and do it all automatically. So if we can yeah, do absolutely. that, that will be and, fantastic. And do you imagine people will share these workflows? Like what will be the mechanism for, uh, you know, sending a workflow that I've done or measured to another user to validate? So, mm -hmm. like, so, I so I the can imagine like a right whole website. Pretty, of, <laughs> sure, yeah. so the mechanism right now was pretty straightforward. Uh, we share them like as GitHub repositories or inside containers. So there is no major change for researchers. So that was one of the important uh, goals behind CK that you don't like reinvent yet another I no, don't know, format right. and so on. So no, no, you just, whatever you use, you have your container or you have your GitHub repository, you will just slightly change the format, but it's like, you know, file-based format. And then this means that CK can read it and then CK can provide you an API. And that was as important that whenever now I see CK compatible containers, CK compatible, uh, CK compatible GitHub repository, I know that I can start using CK comments to 
install whatever packages are available or run workflows which are inside this GitHub repository container. So this is a unified API. And I think this is extremely important. Uh, just actually to mention, there is a project inside ML Commons about those uh, unified uh, machine learning containers. And again, the idea is similar to provide you a stable and consistent API so that whenever you get someone else, someone else's project, you know how to run it. We don't have that. Yeah. So, you know, I think I'm sold. I think CK is awesome. Um, cool. <laughs> I, I know you touched on this, but but if uh, if a viewer is interested in learning more about CK, do you have a recommendation for like a good starting point? Uh, MLperf might be a little intimidating. Are, are there certain <laughs> workloads or benchmarks that are more approachable and uh, a good way to just kind of like learn the tool and ecosystem? That's a very good point. Yes, we do. So I mentioned the paper, which uh, like a summary paper she wrote, uh, I think last year. And there I have a pointers to very simple workflows that uh, just, um, I think we used a lot, um, a very basic benchmark to detect um, uh, edges on images. It doesn't use any machine learning, anything, uh, even though it can be used like uh, with deep learning. But we started using it about 15 years ago. In my, like when I was still doing a PhD and then I continue kind of using it. And so we have this workflow. Uh, it's very simple. It, it requires, it may take like a few minutes to compile and run this project. And I think I provide links in this paper, which I mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, perfect. That seems like a great starting point. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like we don't have any other questions. Uh, so I, I do want to thank you. I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on, especially so late. Um, that, that was an awesome presentation. I'm, I'm very optimistic for the future of standardized benchmarking and machine learning. Uh, thank um, you so for having so me. Gregory. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure, and I'm fine to stay late uh, because those. Okay. Uh, and I, I would like to thank all the crowd who's still there. So, if you have any questions later, please just get in touch with me or with everyone at OctaML, and we'll be happy to talk to you about all this automation.